No, this video's title is not an exaggeration. No, this isn't hyperbole. No, this isn't some bending of the rules where you play a character who is technically a magical girl. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, as of the release of the Tian Sha Character Guide, you can officially, rules as written, play a magical girl. And let me show you just how serious I am about all of this. Now where was I? The Starlit Sentinel dedication implies that your character has been chosen by the actual stars themselves and has been granted an alternate persona transformation. This transformation is activated by utilizing your seal. This seal can really be any tiny object that you want attached to your person. It can be a brooch, a ring, a wand, anything you'd like. Mine is my ego. Should you ever lose your transformation seal, you can spend one week of downtime to bind to a new one. Now, what exactly does this transformation do? Well, for one action once per hour, you can activate this transformation, which will cause your armor, clothing, and one single weapon of your choice to change into an alternate design. No, it does not have to be pink, but it is heavily encouraged. Even though all your equipment looks different, it does function almost entirely the same, but you do get a plethora of different bonuses from being in this form. First off, this alternate persona is even better than the normal impersonate action to keep yourself hidden because you don't need to actively roll deception checks. No, you only have to worry if somebody is actively trying to figure out who you are. And even then, it's not your deception. It's 20 plus your proficiency bonus for the DC to uncover your identity. This means it's a crazy high DC to ever connect that your character and their starlet transformation are the same person. While in this transformation, your weapon of choice gets a plus one to all damage rolls involving that weapon and gets a secondary function where you can shoot starlit bolts of energy from a 60 foot range increment using your melee attacks. Meaning you fighters out there with the starlit sentinel dedication can use your full weapon proficiency with a 60 foot range granted only for 1d4 force damage. But it's force damage. Even cooler is that these bolts still apply all the runes on your weapons. If you've got a flaming longsword and you shoot a 1d4 bolt, that bolt is still applying the bonus fire damage from flaming. This transformation lasts for 10 minutes or until you turn it off, and like I said, you can only do it per hour, so you better hope you don't have multiple encounters within those 60 minutes, otherwise someone might start to put two and two together and we wouldn't want that to happen, would we? At level 4 you can take special sentinel technique which gives you your choice of one of up to two different focus spells for the archetype, and you can take this feat twice to gain both of them if you want to. Let's go over those spells right now. The first is Luminous Stardust Healing. You pick a creature within 30 feet of you and for two actions, cover them in stardust. I promise it's probably not glitter. It's probably glitter. The target immediately regains 16 hit points. This heals just as much as Lay on Hands, but it's got a 30 foot range. And if they were currently possessed by anything, you can make a counteract check against the possession. And if you succeed, the evil spirit within them is is pushed out of their form and cannot inhabit their body again for one week. Make sure that's edited in post so it sounds like I said it on the first take. But if you fail the counteract check, you can't attempt a further counteract check with this focus spell for one full week. This heightens really well too. Eight additional hit points per rank of the spell. This is basically a ranged lay on hands. Granted, it's for two actions. It also can't deal damage to certain targets like Lay on Hand, so I think it's a really good balance. If you want your Stardust Sentinel to have some healing capabilities, it's hard to go wrong here. Alternatively, if you want your Starlit Sentinel to be more aggressive, you can- What are these hand signs? I'm having way too much fun. <laughs> You can take the Shining Starlight Attack. This is a two action focus spell that causes a saving throw against 2d10 damage of a type in an area. Why am I being so vague? Well, because all of these details are determined by the constellation that has blessed you with the Starlit Sentinel transformation. The type of saving throw, the area of the effect, and the type of damage are all determined in advance by your constellation. For example, if you were chosen by the Swordswoman constellation, then your special attack is a 30-foot line of falling, piercing damage swords from the sky on a 
basic reflex save. But if you were chosen by the forest dragon constellation, then you use a 15 foot cone with a basic fortitude save against poison damage. This entire chart on screen here showcases all the different constellations and ability mix-ups and matchups and whatever, and I like this because I feel like you could easily homebrew your own as long as you follow these basic instructions of it's either a 15-foot cone or 30-foot line, it's going to be one of the three uh, saving throws, and you can choose a damage type. I think if you're go working with your GM to make a Starlet Sentinel specifically for your character, making up your own constellation in the sky would be so cool and probably lead to some great stories hooks. Now regardless of what damage type or saving throw type your ability uses, one thing is consistent. If a creature ever critically fails their saving throw against your special attack, they are dazzled until the start of your next turn. Now I do need to be clear. Either of these focus spells, they're both great, but they both come with a very, very important caveat that this feat mentions in detail. In order to use either of these focus spells, you need to name them, and the name of the ability is the incantation required to use them. So if you want to use your Falling Holy Swords from the Swordswoman constellation, then you'll need to name it something like Shining Sword Sunder. Sorry, I've been watching a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh, so I get way too into this. So yes, rules as written, every time you use either of these focus spells, your character has to shout them out loud, and I think that is fantastic. At level 8, you get Majestic Proclamation. By stating your name, you can incite fear in all enemies within 30 feet. This is just a giant 30 foot wide emanation demoralize, and if your last action was to do your transformation, then Majestic Proclamation only costs one action instead of two. On top of this, anyone who fails their saving throw against your Majestic Proclamation is dazzled for one minute. Remember, when you are dazzled, all other creatures are considered consistent sealed from you, meaning they just have a 20% chance to miss all of their targeted abilities, including beneficial abilities that target their allies. And if they critically fail against this, they're blinded for a round first, and then dazzled for the rest of the minute. This is spectacular. Blade of the Heart is so unnecessarily cool, but also weirdly situational and kind of weak at times. For one action, you take your transformed weapon and stab an adjacent ally through the heart with it. However, it does not harm your ally. Rather, your ally's heart inscribes a temporary rune onto your weapon. For the rest of your transformation, your weapon is considered having that rune attached to it. For example, if your ally is really hot-headed, maybe their heart inscribes flaming onto your magical weapon. Now, the biggest downside of this feat is the rune inscribed by your ally's heart does count towards your weapon's maximum rune amount. So if you have a plus two weapon and you want to use Blade of the Heart, you can only have one rune of your choice on there, and then you're going to have to stab your friends to get the second rune. Meaning, until you stab your friend, you are working with a below average weapon. But I really love the flavor of this feat, and I do think it's great. It might be overpowered if it did inscribe an extra rune onto your weapon, but it's a level 10 feat. I don't know, that's dealer's choice in my opinion. But I love that they specifically say the rune you gain from your ally should be chosen by your GM based on their personality or your relationship. Such a cool feature, and I've never seen Sailor Moon. I don't know if this is something they do in the show, but I think that is freaking awesome. Great job, Paizo. Desperate Wish. At level 12, you gain the Breath of Life spell, you know, the thing that lets you revive someone who just died. You can do that once per day. However, you can only do it while you're in your transformation, and this takes so much energy that the second you finish it, your transformation ends. But I also love that because I'm imagining this amazing fight in the middle of like town square where everybody knows who the original character is, but no one's connected it to the Starlit Sentinel persona, but then like their ally dies in this confrontation and they immediately just breath of life as a reaction to save their ally and their entire transformation drops and everyone's just like, oh my god. It's that guy. Super cool feat. You can now put resurrection on literally any character in the entire game, which I guess you probably always could have with a cleric archetype. But still, being able to get Breath of Life on an archetype is fantastic, and I love the flavor of how it works with your transformation. And finally, level 14 gives us our most complicated feat, Sentinel's Orbit. You get a fly speed. 
That's it. That's all it does. It's just level 14 fly, which is pretty good for an archetype, not gonna lie. Most classes don't get flight until like level 16 or 18, so getting it through an archetype at 14, pretty dang good, especially with no feet chain attached to it. A lot of flight, if you look at something like the Kobold, there's feet chains attached to acquiring flight for your character, but not for the Starlet Sentinel. As long as you have the dedication, you can pick this up and you can fly. Granted, it's only while you're in your Sentinel form. You can't just fly willy-nilly. You basically get 10 minutes of flight per hour. Still phenomenal. And there you go, that is the Starlit Sentinel archetype coming to you next week in the Tian Sha character guide. I had to go full ham with this. I love all of this. I love that Pathfinder is not afraid to say, hey, here's this cultural thing that we really, really enjoy. We're going to make it our own and put it into our game so that people can actually play these characters that they've wanted to. People have been playing Magical Girls for years, and the fact that they have an official rules-as-written way to play it, that GMs won't have to make something up for them, is super cool. And it's something I love that Paizo does, that yeah, some people may look at this and say, whoa, that's way too many choices. And you're valid for thinking that. But other people are gonna look at it and go, oh my God, there's something here for everybody. And that's how I see Paizo's massive release of archetypes and classes and all the combinations you can do with them, is it will make it so anybody can make their perfect ideal character flavor-wise using official content. And I think that's fantastic. But that's it for me. Shout out to all the members of the Nonet Ones Patreon on screen. They support me and this channel more than any other source of income I have. If you would like to also help support the channel and keep me doing what I can do, which is apparently putting on pink makeup and whatever that was, then you can click the link in the description and pledge $10 a month to help me continue doing that. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time, Nonet Ones.